first of all, I admire you guys and women because this is a moving target, right? COPD doesn't just stay there, no, it changes, it, it morphs. And it's associated with all these other comorbidities. And I've always wondered, now I got you guys trapped on a TV panel, I get to ask you this. Um, it's associated with heart disease, associated with osteoporosis, a lot of respiratory infections, and with depression. How much of this is due to the COPD or how much of this is a fellow traveler, people with COPD get these things because they are who they are? How do you begin to tease that out? I think we need to do is look at the individual, and not look at the disease. It's very nice to see high blood can, can pressure. Can I just stop you? That is the most profound thing I've heard in a very long time. You look at the individual, not the disease. This isn't a textbook. So, but the point here is, it's not that it has COPD or has diabetes or heart disease. Uh, those three conditions were produced by cigarette smoking. If your chart, if your patient has the prior two ones and don't have COPDs because you cannot look for it. You cannot done a spirometry to make a diagnosis. We understand now that it's not an individual has a disease. The individual has been affected with a consequence of cigarette smoking. Therefore, he or she has coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, COPD, osteoporosis, depression, and we have to look at all those conditions together. So, yeah, Byron. Yeah, I, you, know, the, you know, it's very common. I mean, you know, and I agree completely with what Antonio said. I mean, you need to treat the person with COPD, not the COPD. The foundation did a survey uh, of some 3,000 patients a number of years ago, and 50% of them had six to 10 comorbid conditions, and another 20% had over 11. You can only envision how many medicines those people would walk away with by being prescribed for their different medica for their different processes. Uh, you need to treat the person, and that's not a simple thing to do. I, I'm not sure we have the data on this. If you're going to look at a COPD person, a person with COPD, let's be very correct about this, and they have 10 medications. Do we have a control group, age corrected, uh, of how many medicines is somebody without COPD on at the same age? Do we know? Well, there are some data to suggest that after age 65, the average person, I think it's three to four, and then you get up to 70 and it goes up, you get up to 80 and we're talking, you know, seven to eight to 10. So it is fewer medications for someone who does Got not it. have COPD uh, and is mainly someone who has not been a long-term smoker. But one of the things I also wanted to point out is that we have about 20% of people who do not have smoking, personal smoking, individual smoking, as their risk factor for COPD. Mm -hmm. And we can't forget those very important people. So you can't only say, well, you're a long-term smoker, you probably have COPD, because there are others that have the symptoms, the, all the signs, and you have to think about COPD in those people. Maybe they were around other smokers. Maybe they're in an occupation where they have lots of inhalation triggers. So please don't forget those people. If it looks like COPD, go ahead and evaluate it. Barbara, I just want to stress that because, you know, we know very little about how COPD actually behaves in the non-smoking population. So if there are, for argument's sake, 30 million people in this country with COPD and 20 or 25 percent of them never actually smoked, that's a lot of people. And yet, I think pretty much every study ever done in COPD eliminated people who not, never smoked. So it's a whole huge area we don't know much about. Yeah. So worldwide, sorry, worldwide is uh, biomass exposure, the number one oh. cause of uh, COPD. Yeah. Worldwide. worldwide. Yeah, and in South Texas, I see ladies that grew up in the rural area that they helped their mothers to cook and they have wood stoves. So they wow. were exposed to that for eight, 10 years never smoke, they are now in their 50s, and they have a structure. So we need to, like Barbara said, we need to remember other causes of this condition. You were gonna say. No, I was, um, uh, I was just gonna say, I was a visiting professor in India last week, and half the COPD there is biomass. Uh, similarly, as, as, as Antonio was saying, in, in South America, in Mexico, uh, it's the women who get it. Uh, there's been a lot of now studies about the phenotype of the COPD in that non-smoking population. One of the problems in, in some of the societies, the women are not tall. And so they're probably a little more vulnerable to COPD in the sense of the lung growth and size <clears throat> and, uh, and exactly the natural history of that when the exposure is removed is being studied. I think one of the common factors of all these uh, comorbid conditions is inflammation 
from cigarette smoking. And people worried about dental plaque causing coronary artery disease when you have an entire lung, a massive organ full of inflammation. You can imagine the effects of that. <clears throat> and we were gonna say from uh, not only in practice but in clinical trials, like in the TORCH study, we power mortality studies on all cause mortality because the COPD patient, one third will die of heart disease, about a third will die of lung cancer, and then a third, maybe a little bit older, will die of the, of the COPD. Yeah, that's so, what I was getting at earlier. Yeah, it's There's really a... important to, uh, to, uh, to look at the patient in the setting of their comorbidities. I still practice every day, and as we all do on the panel here, and the biggest problem, though, is the, again, uh, with the multiple medicines that you talked right. about, Peter and Barbara, uh, is the uh, lack of affordability in the donut yeah, hole. We're going yeah, to gonna get to that. I know, we're going to get to it later, and that is an extremely important concept because we know, again, from the studies I just mentioned, like TORCH, well, one of the most important causes of poor survival is non-compliance, non-adherence, and that's mm -hmm. usually a co so often a cost let's factor. Let's put that in this silo just for a minute, because I want to ask another, I'm sorry. So let ahead. me bring another important sure. issue in comorbidities. Uh, so this group in Spain, they have look exacerbations, and why patient won't come back. So they have these nursing staff, they go to their house, they do everything that we're supposed to do, and patients keep coming back. What they start doing is examine the patient's mouth. People who have more dental disease are the people who have more exacerbations and more problems. And that's something that we don't do. You know, I'm the only one in the clinic that uses tongue depressors. Yeah. Nobody uses tongue depressors, <laughs> and it's ridiculous. You know, and I don't even know. And I'm the one that I'm the one nurses. <laughs> I need tongue depressors, I look at everybody's mouth. I, I don't know if that's a marker or there's an ideologic relationship, but it's fascinating. <laughs> but you have to look in their mouth, and this dental disease, you have to have a go look at the dentist because we forget the dental disease will impact, will impact the rest of the disease. So come on, I go back to my initial statement. We need to look at the individual.